final home stretch of Romans, a long series on Romans. Okay, well, let's have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for blessing us. We thank you for this um, wonderful Sabbath day, Lord. As we, as we finally uh, come to the end of the book of Romans, Lord, we pray that we retain the beautiful lessons that we have learned all along the way. And we praise you and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The refreshing fellowship to stand in accord, hand in hand, walking with the Lord. To walk in the way as we are called to stand and to experience walking in joy hand in hand, to do what we have been called to do and to walk in the way that is true, no longer walking in strife and hate, but looking forward to those heavenly gates, to a world where there is no longer any crime, but looking forward to a joy that will last for all time. Well, this is the final message. I, I didn't even have time to make a poem. That poem I kind of <laughs> put together just <laughs> on the spot today because I didn't have the time. <laughs> but I said, well, let me, I got to end the, this discussion with a poem. I have to end it with a poem. Well, um, so we're talking about Romans 16. The last time we were talking about Andronicus and Junia. We were looking at verse number seven. And one of the points that's important to consider is that all these people that Paul is speaking about here in this chapter, we don't really hear much, if any, about these people throughout the book of Romans or, or in the rest of the Bible. And as I pointed out last time, this is one of the things that shows us this is, that it's true, that it's a true, uh, these are true accounts. Because why would you just put a bunch of names there and say, greet this person, greet that person, if nobody knew who they were? And just make up that are nowhere else mentioned in Scripture. Just wouldn't mention, wouldn't make any sense to do that. So it shows that, yes, this is a true account. And when you do ministry with people, it draws you closer together. So these are people that Paul must have interacted with in his time in doing ministry. These are people that he must have done work with. Uh, along the way. And so um, ministry draws you closer together. When you have a church, and I kind of had an idea a long time ago that when Jesus sent out those disciples two by two, maybe he put people together who are having trouble with one another. You know, because once you do ministry with somebody, if you're having conflict with that person, but now you're doing ministry together, and you're working and you're interacting, you know, with other people who may be challenging you, who maybe you, t it draws the two of you together. And I remember that experience in one of my previous churches back in New York, that uh, there was some tension there in the church, but when we did ministry, people came together and it drew people together. We went doing door to door and it actually would draw the people together when you interact with other people and do that ministry in the word in particular, you do that ministry in the word and you share and you, but I think also in doing other forms of ministry, like doing what you're doing here and the food bank and other kinds of ministry, it draws you closer together to minister. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we see uh, Paul knows all these people, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, you know, it's easy to forget people's names. When you come to a church and you forget people's names and you and and then, uh, but when you work with other, when you work with people, you have experiences in the Lord with them. That really, I think, draws you together. So Paul speaks about um, Andronicus and Junia in verse seven. He says, "These are my countrymen and fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles." And he said, and, and, "And who also were in Christ before me." So these were people that had come to the Lord before even he came to the Lord. And then he goes on to say to greet uh, Amplius, um, my beloved in the Lord. So he mentions somebody named Amplius. He says, uh, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. 
and greet Stachys, my beloved, and greet, he mentions, Apelles, approved in Christ, and greet uh, the household of Astrobolus. So he's mentioning all these people, and I think these households are households of faith. These may have been home churches that, as I mentioned last time, we were talking in verse 5 about greet the church that is in their house, talking about uh, Priscilla and Aquila. So these may have been home churches. He says, greet Herodian, my countrymen. And he, in verse number 11, greet Herodian. Or is it Herodias or Herodian? I get Herodian. Huh? Herodian, right? Okay, greet Herodian, my countrymen, and greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labored in the Lord, and greet the beloved Perseus, who labored much in the Lord. So these are all people who labored in the Lord. These are people who had done the work in the Lord. And what a blessing it is to be able to say, I labored in the Lord. I have done the work of the Lord. I am doing the work of the Lord. I have finished the good fight. I have completed the course. I have won the race. You know, that type of language. That it's an encouraging thing to know that you're being moved by the Spirit as, and to walk by faith. And so these are people that Paul is having the experience with. And he says, uh, greet Rufus, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. And so when he says his mother and mine, that's interesting. I'm not sure what he means by that. Whether he's, uh, I'm assuming he's being, meaning spiritually or maybe he's close to Rufus's mother and it's almost as though it's his own mother. Maybe that's what he's talking about. But I'd have to actually look into that more and see why does he say, but you know, there's so many details in this that the people who would have heard it would have known, yes, I know what he's talking about. And maybe we don't fully understand it because this was a long time ago, but it shows, yes, yeah, this is authentic. You know, Paul had real experiences with these people and he was close to them. Church wasn't just a formality where we go for a few minutes and then, and then we leave. No, these are real people, real experiences that he's learned to enjoy that reflect he's looking forward to that refreshing fellowship with people that he's done ministry with one of the guys that well i've done uh ministry with several people over the years and i think back to um ministering with uh rasheen who was a brother there in new york we've done ministry together and i always remember that ministry we did some bold ministry by the grace of god that was when we were ministering to those so-called hebrew israelites remember that group i told you about before well, basically, they dress up in these costumes and things. Well, they don't consider them costumes. This group was, uh, this group was called Israel United in Christ. But they're neither Israel, and they're not united in Christ. But that's what they consider themselves. As I mentioned before, it's basically um, like a hate group. Basically, it's you know they would say that true Israel are African Americans and um, Hispanic. Hispanics and Native Americans. That's true Israel. Anybody else not Israel? If you're white, you're an Edomite. They call you Edomite. If you're white, you're an Edomite. And if you're Indian or you're Asian, no, that's not the true Israel is this group. So they don't really even so they don't even believe in, you know, treating other people in a sense like they're real people. I mean, if you believe other certain people, certain races are damned, that's a gospel of the flesh, right? Literally, you're looking at the flesh. And so that was a group that uh, Brother Rasheen had told me about. And he said, you know, I want you to come and I want to go there and, and try and minister there. And that, that was an interesting ministry. Mike Paranello is another guy. Lance Keith, just somebody that I had met just doing ministry. He was not even an Adventist, but he, and he started joining me in ministry. And so um, when I was doing preaching down in uh, Jamaica, Queens, in the subway station there, Sophie went, I remember Sophie went down there that one time, and she was there doing ministry with me. She was watching the literature at the table. And I always remember that. When you do ministry with people, you know, those, you know, those things really uh, stay solidified in your mind. So I'm sure that Paul must have had these ex real experiences with these people that he's mentioning. And all these names, somebody might say, oh, why does he write this? Why does he mention all these? And then he goes on in verse 14, and he says, uh, greet Asyncratus, and greet Phlegon, and greet Hermas, and greet uh, Petrobus, 
and greet Hermes and all the brethren who are with them. And we're saying, well, who are these people? Why would he? It just ruins the letter. We want to hear a theological. No, he's, it was important for him to mention all these people, all these names, a lot of Greek names you can hear from the names, a lot of Greek names of people who have come uh, to the Lord, and uh, Greek-sounding names anyway. And so then he goes on to see uh, greet Philoglus and Julia in verse number uh, 15, and Nereus and his sister and Olympus, and greet all the saints that are with them. See how it mentions saints? You see that? So any believer is a saint. See? Because you have uh, the Catholic understanding is basically the, the saint is someone that's canonized, right? They're canonized, and it's almost as though, well, you're only really called a saint after you're dead. <laughs> no, Paul is saying, no, these are the saints. These are the believers. So I could say to all of you, I'm grateful to be in the presence of the saints today because all of you are saints. You see, if you're a believer in Christ, you're a saint. That's the biblical way, and that's what Paul is saying there. It's not, uh, you know, any believer is a saint. It's not a special class of people, you know. It's any believer. I think the understanding within Catholicism is the saint is understood to be in heaven now because they have an understanding that pretty much everybody goes to purgatory. You, you die, you got to go to purgatory. Generally speaking, everybody's got to go to purgatory. Now, there may be a saint that has just been so pure that they didn't go to pur purgatory at all. But pretty much everybody's got to go there. Now, some saints may have spent some time in purgatory, basically where you're purged. It's a pur purging process. You may have, uh, you know, you have mortal sins. In the Catholic system, you've got two classes of sins, so to speak. You have the mortal sins, and then you have the venial sins. And, you know, everybody got some venial sins, and, you know, so you got to go get some purging done and do those type of things. All None of this is biblical but that's the, the the system and so you got to get purged and you got to you know you got to go through purgatory and get you know look forward to that and you could be in purgatory for thousands and thousands of years and that was part of what indulgences took part in right you can pay indulgences to have uh, quicken that process but imagine that imagine that you you the average catholic the understanding is you're going to go to purgatory, and it's going to be very hard and difficult, and it'll last a long time. So when you go to a Catholic funeral, the understanding is they're in purgatory, and they're suffering. I remember one Catholic said to me, it's, it's pretty much like hell, except eventually get out of there. That's how they understood it, because, you know, you're purging, getting purged, and you're suffering, and it's pretty much like hell, except eventually you get out of there. Now, if you knew you were going to suffer, and I don't know the theology because the theology is so warped and twisted and full of philosophy that it's so hard to really get nail down some of the answers on some of this stuff. But if you knew you were going to go through this for, I don't know, a thousand years, <laughs> you wouldn't really look forward to it, right? Now, praise the Lord, that's not what the Bible teaches. <laughs> that's not what the Bible teaches. And so the understanding of being a saint all believers are saints. It's not some believers. No, all believers, if we look at the biblical point of view, all believers are saints. And then he says, greet one another with a holy kiss in verse number 16. There was an, uh, a brother down at a uh, church back in Babylon, Long Island. He always used to joke around and say, come on, give me a holy kiss. <laughs> but the holy kiss is probably a little kiss on the cheek. You know, some European nations, I think uh, European people tend to do that, right? They'll, greet one another, give, give a kiss on the cheek and things like that. So that's probably something along the lines of what the holy kiss w was. And then he says, the, the churches of Christ greet you. The churches of Christ greet you. And then he says something in verse number 17. He says, now I urge you, I urge you, brethren, to note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine you learned. Doctrine. Some, you live in a world where people say, hey, doctrine's not important. No, Paul is saying, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine you learned and avoid them. See, a doctrine is very important, right? 
Now, you're talking about earlier about the doctrine, which is all based in Christ, because it's all based in Christ, right? But you're not saying, ah, doctrine doesn't matter. You're just saying, no, you got to know Christ to know the true doctrine. And it's true. And um, a lot of people don't understand, and there are people attacking the Adventist church who don't know our doctrines. They'll say, oh, you believe in salvation by works. Oh, we don't believe in salvation by works. <laughs> Well, the, the, now, we don't believe that the commandments don't matter, but we're not saved by the commandments, right? Je did Jesus keep the commandments? Yes. And if Christ is in me and his character is in me, well, then, uh, 1 John 5, 2 and 3, I'm going to love the law. It's not going to be a burden to me, right? Or what we see in Revelation 14, 12. And people play games, and they say, oh, well, that's uh, you know, the word that's used there is, it's not the same word. It doesn't mean the commandments of the Ten Commandments. Well, just look in Mark, as I've said it before, 10, 19. The same word is used there. And let me turn there quickly, make sure I got that one right. Mark 10, 19, uh, which says, and you know the commandments. That's the same word. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your... Aren't those the Ten Commandments mentioned? And the same word is used. The same word's used, that's used in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commands. Same word is used in Revelation 14 and verse 12. This is the patience of the saints. These are those that love the, uh, that, that uh, uh, keep the commandments of God, right? And have what, D? Testimony. And testimony, right? Or the faith, is it faith of Jesus? Or is it testimony? John 4. Testimony, okay, Revelation 14, 12. But anyway, that's the same word, talking about the commandments of, of God. Okay, and that's, it, so there's really no way to play around with that, but a lot of people like to play around with that. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's really about one commandment. <laughs> it's really about the one that says remember. It's not about uh, we don't. We could disregard honor your father and mother. We could disregard thou shalt not murder. We could disregard thou shalt. No, they're not talking about any of the. It always comes down to the one commandment that says remember that we've talked about last time. So Paul is saying note those who cause these divisions and offenses. So from the very beginning, the church was having strife and difficulty with people that were trying to attack the message and to divide the church and to create confusion, according there to verse number 17 of Romans chapter 16. And then he says in verse number uh, 18, he says, for those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but what do they serve? Their own belly. Their own belly. You see how he uses that word belly? He's talking about appetite. It's not necessarily that they're looking to eat food all the time, <laughs> that they're coming to the church to eat food. He's talking about the service of appetite. And ultimately, when you think about it, he said they don't serve God, but their own belly. And he says with smooth words and flattering speeches, deceive the heart of the simple. But he's talking about they're serving their own appetites because it's our appetite that gets in the way of receiving the truth of what the Bible is saying. It's the appetite. Think about the appetite. You know, there, you, a person could have a PhD and be highly intellectual person and not believe in the Bible. Right now, the Holy Spirit is not far from anybody. Right, the truth it's a person can is God far from anyone? No, no. and He wants us to know the truth. In fact, there's that wonderful passage in um, uh, Acts 17 26 and 27. Let's take a quick look at that. And I've mentioned that before, but let's go back there and look at that idea the idea of Acts. 17, Acts 17, 26 and 27. And so here we see Acts 17, 26 and 27. 
And he, that's talking about God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Talking about everybody that exists all over the earth, everywhere. It's saying God has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. Now that in itself is an amazing thought. And then it goes on to say, so that they should seek the Lord. So if they grew up in Pakistan, right? Where you, where you grew up doing ministry, as you were mentioning. If they grew up there, now somebody would say, well, how could they seek the Lord there? It's a Muslim stronghold. Or if they grew up some in the forests of uh, South America somewhere and grew in, among some indigenous people there, steeped in animism or forms of paganism, thing, how could they, uh, how could they, possibly learn the gospel how would it, they even have a chance but here we're saying it says um, determine their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings this is talking about the work of God we don't fully understand how it could be and it says so that they should seek the Lord that they should seek the Lord how can they seek the Lord they have a conscience right we saw in Romans chapter 2 uh, 14 and 15 they have a conscience. Everybody has a conscience. So even if you grow up in a culture where there's some strange things that you say, something is wrong with this, you have an opportunity to grasp what little light that the Lord can reveal through conscience. That's why, as I said in the past, Sodom and Gomorrah were held accountable. They might have not been Israelites, might not have had the scripture, but they could know that what they were doing there was wrong. And so as we saw in Romans 1.20, we can know about God's invisible attributes to the things that are created. There, there is that testimony of creation for everyone. God is, to whom much is given, much is required. So God is not going to hold somebody accountable to know all the things, details written in Scripture that were not available for them to possibly know, but there are basics they can know. And when you receive that light, even if it's through a vision, or through a dream, God can reach people. And I remember taking that class, cross-cultural ministry at Andrews University with Wagner Kuhn, was the name of the professor. And he was showing and giving testimonies of people in Muslim places and other areas of the world that even received visions. So God can reach anybody if they're willing to receive it. Well, Paul, I mean, if you think about it, Paul was, yes, Paul was in the area of the world where Jesus existed and Christianity was. But Paul himself, as a Pharisee, he was steeped also in a mindset that would have made him hostile to Christianity. And yet, on the road to Damascus, right on the way to persecute Christians, he had that experience. <laughs> he had the experience. So when we read here in verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him. You know, what is that groping? You know, in some way a person feeling, right, in, in the darkness, kind of like, you know. And, and, and that's what, by nature, we're all in the darkness, right, of sin and the sinful nature. But grope for him and find him. But it says, though he is not far from each one of us. So somehow, no matter where, a person is in the world, Jesus isn't far from any one of them. But what gets in the way? As I mentioned, the appetite, right? I mentioned the appetite in verse number 18. He said they don't, they don't serve God but their own belly. In other words, the appetite. The appetite is basically of the flesh, right? My flesh, I, I have concerns. I'm afraid. I don't want to, you know, I, I, I want to be safe. And that type of thinking can manipulate a person's reasoning. Like I said, you know, when, when a person's driven by appetite and by emotions, they could have a PhD, they could be somebody that is highly educated, but their appetite and their emotions can actually be driving how they think about things. So when somebody is a scientist and they and they don't believe in God and they don't believe in the Bible, it's not because of being objective. 
It's not because, well, I'm just being objective. You know, this is the truth. This is logical, and it shows the Bible is wrong. So I believe in the theory of evolution because I'm objective. No, you're not objective. Your appetite, you know, you know very well if you stand up and say, I believe in six-day creation, <laughs> you're not going to have an easy time in the field of science. If you say, I believe in what the Bible says, I take the position, I take the, the moral stand of the Ten Commandments, I take the moral in the world we live in? No, it's very difficult. You say, I stand with the Bible, that's very hard. So the appetite and the emotions can actually be the one in control of the person's reason rather than allowing your reasoning to be led by the spirit so when Paul is speaking about these people and he says for such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly they basically these are individuals who are teaching false doctrines because they're led not by the spirit but by their own appetites their own emotions their own, and you know uh, a person could have a PhD in some area of religious studies. They could have a PhD in biblical languages and Bible history and, you know, in theology and stuff like that and teaching falsehoods just the same way. Because, well, the Pharisees were very, very smart, knowledgeable people, aren't they? And they were led by appetite. <laughs> they like to have their respect they like to be exalted they like to have the good places and the good seats in the synagogue they like to have all these you know they they were people being led by appetite what did i say did i say something wrong oh, okay they were people being led by appetite and emotions the pharisees and the sadducees right people being led by appetite and emotions uh, the devil right the devil knows does the devil know the bible Oh, he knows it inside out, but he's not being led by the Spirit. So Jesus, uh, so, so Paul, rather, is talking here about people who were, you know, they'd flatter you. That's what he says. Smooth words and flattering speeches deceive the heart of the simple. Flattery is a very dangerous thing. When someone flatters you and they th say things, you got to be careful with that, especially as a, well, anybody, really. But... That's how a person can get deceived. And so these individuals are coming to church and maybe they say, hey, you know, you have some really good insights. You look like you're really studying the Bible. You, I like the things you're saying. And then they get, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, you, I like the way you dress too. I like, you know, you got the Holy Spirit. You're a, somebody could say you're a man or a woman of God and it's just flattery in order to bring about a relationship that will be a relationship for the purpose of manipulation and that's kind of the kind of thing that we always have to be careful about uh, we have to be very prayerful about and so Paul then goes on now speaking about the Roman church who he's very defensive of and he says again in verse number 19 he says uh, for your obedience is known to all so this was a church this is like I said this was the church that later on in history would pretty much pave the way to apostasy. This was the church, according to Samuel Bakioki in his, his book from Sabbath to Sunday. It was the Roman church that really pushed for Sunday later on in all of the, right, the papacy and the rise of the papacy. And you think about the, the, the Roman church, right? But in Paul's time, he's saying your obedience. So it started out. With that first love experience, your obedience is known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. So he was very glad with that. And he was very protective of them. Didn't want them to get deceived. And he says, but I want you to be wise concerning what is good and simple concerning evil. Wise in what is good, simple and evil. Because the Bible says, by beholding you become changed. Right? Isn't that what the Bible teaches? So sometimes when we, so we get intrigued as human beings by dark and evil things, sometimes. Some people are drawn to conspiracy theories and, you know, you know getting into that type of stuff. And sometimes you've got to be careful because you get so focused in on that type of thing and then you, you're no longer focused on Christ. 
And so, yeah, it's true. The devil, there is a conspiracy. There's a great controversy. Satan was working behind the scenes. We know these things are true, but we have to keep our minds on the Lord and stay focused. And then he says, he says, the God of peace, verse 20, will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The God of peace. Jesus brings that peace. That's, pre- that's the thing that everybody wants, peace. What people don't realize, they want peace, or people think peace comes through other means. Well, if I have money, then I'll have peace. If I have fame, I'll have peace. If I have this house, I'll have peace. If I look like this, I'll have peace. If it's that, all these exterior things <laughs> will give me peace. No, peace comes from the Holy Spirit in your life, bringing the fruit of the Spirit. And so we think of those wonderful words in in John. Uh, let me turn back to John 7, 38. John 7, 38. John 7 and verse number 38. And he says, wait, nope, I'm in the wrong place. No, it's not John 7, 38. I must have gotten mixed up. John 7, 38. No, I was in John. I was looking for a passage, and I thought it was John 7, 38. And it's not John 7, 38. Maybe it's John 7, no, nope. John 7.30. Well, I'll have to look that one up another time. Is it John 7.48? Let me see. John 7.48. No. No, no, no. I don't know what happened there. I always remember it as John 7.38. John 7.30. Oh, John 7.38. Oh, yes. John, did I say John 7, 38? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like John. And did I skip? How did I miss that? Yeah, well, that's the one. It says, uh, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I don't know why I didn't see it when I first out looked at it. Huh? Out of the belly. Uh, yours says that? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, it, well, it makes sense, too, because the Holy Spirit will guide and and refine our appetites right we have appetites and some people feel like well you know i'm born this way i can't change i have these appetites and holy spirit can change your appetites yeah i remember years ago i was watching this guy named wayne dyer this was long this before i was an adventist and he was a new age speaker but he made a good point in one of his presentations uh even though you know, now looking back on it, a lot of what he was sharing was Babylonian spiritual confusion. But uh, they were playing him pretty often back then in, in uh, Channel 13, um, and back in New York on Channel 13, the um, public network, you know, and they had a lot of his presentations. And one of the points that he said was, uh, he was talking to a bunch of children, and he said, when you squeeze an orange, what comes out? <laughs> And the girl said, that's dumb. And he said, why? <laughs> what is it? And he said, she said, orange juice. He said, you're right, you're really smart. And she felt so happy that he said that. He said, now when you get squeezed, what comes out? <laughs> so he said, well, why does the orange come out of the orange juice? Because that's what's inside. Now when you get squeezed and out of you comes anger and out of you comes resentment, and out of you comes hatred when you get, in other words, the situations of life, right? The, the, the situations of life or high pressure situations, stress, or maybe somebody who is poking and prodding you and instigating against you. And out of you comes anger and strife. And it's not because they put it in there. You see, they say, well, he made me angry, right? No, it's because that's what's inside, right? It's what's inside. And so when we look at that passage, yeah, when Jesus says, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then it goes on to say, but this he spoke concerning the what? The spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, but 
uh, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy, Jesus had not yet ascended, and that outpouring of the Holy Spirit didn't yet happen, and we read about in Acts. Um, so, but the, when a person receives the Holy Spirit, and then something different is going on inside of them, and your appetites change, and your attitude changes, and all of that, and you experience that peace, that fruit of the Spirit, right? Talking about the orange and the fruit, well, there's the fruit of the Spirit, and then when someone squeezes you, out comes the juice of the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> That's what's supposed to happen. But we all have a journey to go when it comes to those things, amen? It's a process of going from glory to glory. But that's a process of learning to surrender. I remember years ago, I was watching a presentation about Mr. Rogers. Remember Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Oh, yes. Oh, man. And I remember, um, so in this presentation, you know, this is after he had passed away. And I think his son was one of the people talking. And, and they were also, like, going over his, you know, things that his wife had said and testimony of his wife. And one time the wife said, oh, you know, the... This uh, mechanic, I think it was, somebody that she had interacted with was so mean to her, and she was so upset, and she went and told Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Rogers said, oh, maybe he had a bad day. <laughs> so it seemed that he was always peaceful, <laughs> according to the testimonies that were shared by these people that knew him. And, uh, you know, it's very rare to see that. If it's true, I mean, I don't know, but if it's true, and these things are true about Mr. Rogers, well, that, you know, we should have a good testimony as believers. And um, I always tell that story about that woman that was the worst, meanest customer that we had back when I used to work in that health food store. I used to work in a health food, you know, it was a natural, uh, you know, it was one of those places with herbs and all of that stuff. And this was years ago before I was an Adventist. And this woman came in was the worst and meanest customer <laughs> that I'd ever seen. And it was around the time where this other guy that I worked with started inviting me to the Adventist church. And I went to the Adventist church, and then I saw that woman there. And she was a happy Sabbath and smiling. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, but I remembered, uh, this was the lady that was the meanest customer that, in my whole experience. <laughs> What's that? Maybe she had a bad day. Maybe she had a bad day. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we could all have the we could all have those experiences. But I think what we what we're seeing here is that when uh, Paul is speaking there in Romans chapter sixteen twenty, and he's saying, "May the God of peace crush Satan under your feet slowly." And we think of that peace and that fruit of the spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self control. That all comes really from the the heavenly perspective. Because it's the short-sightedness and the appetite. Well, with the appetite comes short-sightedness, right? I'm, I want something now, right? I need something now. It's not seeing beyond the moment. And when we lose our temper, we're not thinking eternally, right? You can't really think eternally and lose your temper, right? When you, lo when you lose your temper, you're thinking right at that moment. And we all struggle with that. So I think that's very important to consider there. Okay, can I have one of those? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, um, now, and then he goes on to say that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The grace, undeserved favor. And then he goes on in verse number 21 and says, uh, Timothy, Timothy, my fellow worker, and he mentions uh, Lucius and Jason and Sosipater. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Uh, and he mentions all of my, my countrymen greet you. So again, he's, these are people, again, that he was ministering with and his countrymen. So these must have been maybe Jewish, uh, people of a Jewish background who had accepted Christ. And he says, I, Tertius, in verse 22, I, Tertius, who write who wrote this epistle greets you in the Lord. So Tertius was probably because it seems that there's evidence that Paul had um, his eyesight was never quite so good after his experience. That was a pretty bright light. That was a bright light, yeah. 
So he probably had Tertius writing the, the letter and helping him to write the letter. And then maybe Paul said, put your own greeting in there. Tertius, you get to say it too. And so Tertius maybe said, put his own. He said, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you. Imagine being able, able to say, I, I helped Paul write the epistle. Man, what a blessing that would be. And then he says, uh, Gaius, our, my host and the host of the whole church greets you. So maybe Gaius was somebody um, somebody who was, uh, maybe he had a, a, a home church or something like that. Maybe he was ho hosting a, a community of believers somehow. I don't know exactly. And then Orestes, the treasurer of the city, greets you. Some important people were accepting the message. And Cordus, a brother. And then he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And then finally, in the benediction, he says, to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. To him who is able to establish you. God is able to establish you. God is able to keep your feet on firm ground. God is a, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. To him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. And we're talking about the gospel. It wasn't in the Old Testament, wasn't clearly revealed, but was in types and shadows and so forth and sacrifices and stuff. But he says, but now made manifest, verse number 26. And the scriptures, and according to the prophetic scriptures, made known to all nations, right? Say all nations. Made known to all nations, and according to the commandment of the everlasting God for the obedience to the faith. So God has called all people and enabled them to be obedient. See, the gospel is not simply a gospel of, well, Jesus died for me, now I can go live lawlessly. The commandments do play a role, not in that you're saved by the commandments, but if you're in Christ, you're going to keep the commandments you're going to experience victory over sin. The gospel is a gospel of victory. And so finally he says, To God alone wise be glory through Christ Jesus forever. Amen. God alone wise. I love that. All wisdom comes ultimately through Christ. To God alone wise be glory through who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So Jesus glorified God. Jesus revealed the love of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the one who, re you know, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We say Jesus is the love letter, the living love letter of the Father. And so he glorifies the Father. To God alone wise be glory through Christ Jesus forever. Amen. And that is our final uh, wonderful ending to the beautiful book of Romans. Let us have a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we consider this final chapter, Lord, all of these greetings, all of these details of how your servant Paul was remembering as he was closing this letter, just remembering in his memory all these people that he knew, all these people he'd done ministry with, Lord. Lord, we look forward to the new heaven and the new earth where we're going to see faces and people and have memories, Lord, Memories that glorify you, Lord. And we look forward to that experience. And we look forward to that time to come. But while we are on this side of eternity, help us go from glory to glory. Help us to be strengthened and to remember that you alone are wise. And you empower and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit to have victory after victory. In Jesus' name, amen.